Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. It's lovely to see you. And uh, I'm just going to bring this down here. And um, I know I want the tall one. Thank you, though. <laughs> lovely. It is good to see you all. Um, so we're starting a series in Zephaniah. And um, it's a tiny little book in the Bible. Anyone have some trouble finding it there? Oh, you're good. You're on it. It's, it's a bit easier on the smartphone, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, I had rather an interesting uh, weekend this weekend. My middle son had uh, the good fortune of being able to go on his end of year trip, which was awesome. So he um, got to go to Devon, do like, like outward bound stuff, which was really exciting, really great. And I was due to pick him up at 6 p.m. on Friday. And, uh, well, in fact, we were due to pick him up about 5.30. But anyway, um, his group of friends from his school had also planned this weekend to go camping before they knew about the dates of the school trip. And so there I was waiting for this coach, thinking, oh, it's a long coach journey back from, like, the depths of Devon to London. And it took hours. Anyway, they ended up getting back into Chiswick at 9 p.m., and as these kids came off the coach, I kind of thought, oh, this is ridiculous. I think we won't go camping tonight. We'll just go in the morning. But they all came off the coach, and they were super excited that they were going camping together. And I looked at Ben's little face, and he was like, yeah, we're going, aren't we, Mummy? And I kind of went, yeah, maybe. We might need to just think about it. And then he's just his little face, because he said, my sister's already there, isn't she? And I said, yeah, she's already there. She's gone with someone else. And his little face was like, we've got to go, we've got to go, we've got to go now, mummy, we've got to go on the camping trip. I was like, Ben, this is ridiculous. We won't get there till like 11 o'clock. We've got to get petrol in the car, we've got to get some food into you, we've got to get the bags in. This is ridiculous. But I couldn't, like, look at him. His little face just got me. And I was like, okay, Ben, we'll do it. We'll have a mummy-son adventure. Off we go. And we got into the car, and as I was driving into Sussex and going down all these lanes in the middle of the night, and I couldn't see anything, and all these country roads were stretched out before me, and, and we kind of arrived at this campsite, which I thought, great, we've made it to the campsite. I felt really chuffed. I'd, I'd got there and found the right campsite. Got into the campsite, realized you had to drive for miles through a forest to get to the place where your, your tent was. And as I was driving through this forest in the pitch black, I just felt the Lord sort of saying to me, you know the lengths that you go to for your children? I go even further, and I never get weary. And I just sensed in that moment him saying, you know, sometimes I go after you with my great abounding love. And sometimes I come after you with a warning with my judgment, but whichever it is I'm coming after you, I do it because I love you. And the extent to which you go to for your child is nothing compared to what I go to for my children, and I never get tired. And I say that today because we're in a book of the Bible that not many people preach on. I don't know if you've heard a sermon on the book of Zephaniah before. This morning, no one had, I don't, or no one kind of admitted to the fact they had. Um, I don't know if you have tonight. But the reason we don't is that because the first two chapters of it are like a bit, ugh, they're basically chapters of God's judgment on his people and on the world. And we'd rather, often we'd rather hear the words of his love. Now it's going to come, we're going to get to chapter 3, and we're going to hear of God's great love for us. But first, we're going to sit with the uncomfortable words of God's judgment for us. But we need to know that when he speaks like that to us, he is doing it in pursuit of us because he loves us. It is going to be for our good. And so the book of Zephaniah, I think, is a bit like a torch. Um, torches are great. They really highlight things. If I kind of wave it around, they highlight stuff. And the book of Zephaniah is a bit like a torch because basically as God judges us and gives us warnings, it highlights mess in our lives. And he highlights the mess in our lives in order that we can respond and do something about it. 
So it's a bit like a torch, and you might find that helpful as we go through uh, this book. So what I'm going to do this evening is I'm going to give us a little bit of background to the book of Zephaniah, and then we're going to just look at a couple of things that we can take from it into our lives in West London today. So here we go. Bit of background. So at the time of writing, Josiah is king. And Josiah isn't, um, isn't very much older than you guys. He was king at 18, so like just a little bit older than Hannah over there. And um, so really young, so this king at 18 years old. And his cousin was called Zephaniah. And cousin Zephaniah comes up to King Josiah in around the year of sort of 545 BC, around that time. He comes up to him and he says, Josiah, I've got a word from the Lord. And this word from the Lord is quite a word. Do you read that chapter, that chapter one? You might want it out in front of you. It's sort of like, whew, okay, I will sweep away, I will destroy. It's a word of judgment. And it's a really interesting word because throughout the book of Zephaniah, there's sort of two types of judgment that are being spoken about. In verses uh, 1 to 3, if you have a look at them, I don't know if you've noticed this, um, but it kind of has echoes of like when God destroyed the world back in the sort of Noah flood days. You know, it's like that utter destruction. I'm going to sweep away everything. Now, we know, those of us that have like read the story, we know that God promised something after he did that in Noah's time. God promised what? He promised that he was never going to do that again. So what's going on? Why is he prophesying that if God's never going to do that again? Well, God's never going to do that again until... Until the end times, when he sweeps everything clean and renews everything afresh. And so those first few verses are speaking about the sort of end time judgments, way, way in whenever that's going to be. But verses 4 to 6 are doing something really, really different. They're talking about God's judgment that's going to fall on God's people, like now, a local judgment that's going to last for a period of time. So there's two types of kind of judgment that God's warning people about as we go through the book of Zephaniah. So what is King Josiah going to do? How's he going to take uh, Zephaniah's word to him, I wonder? Uh, What do you think he would do? 18 years old, cousin Zephaniah. Can you imagine a minute, one of your relatives coming to you? I've got a word from the Lord. Would you trust them? I don't know. How would you respond? I'm not sure. I think if it was one of my brothers, I'd be like, oh, I don't know. (laughs) I don't know how you'd respond. Well, Josiah responds in an amazing way. Uh, He really is an amazing king. In 2 Kings 23, verse 25, it says this of Josiah. It says, neither before him nor after him was there a king like him who turned to the Lord like he did. He turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his strength. He heard this warning from Zephaniah and he turned to the Lord. Oh God, help me, said Josiah. Josiah took seriously Zephaniah's word from the Lord. And he responded by instigating a widespread uh, reform at the time. He destroyed the idols. He renovated God's temple. And as they were tidying up God's temple in the corner, in a dusty corner, they found the scriptures, God's word to them. And a little bit like some places in West London where Bibles might be sat on a dusty shelf somewhere. He found it and he brought it out. And he said to all the people, come, come listen to the word of God and don't just listen to it, obey it. 
And so King Josiah encouraged people to turn back towards the Lord. And he instigated one of the best reformations of all time. And you can read that back in 2 Kings chapter 22 to 23 or in 2 Chronicles chapters 34 to 35. It's a really amazing story. And if you've never read it, it's definitely worth a read. So that's a little bit of the background. God's people have messed up. God sent the word to Zephaniah because he loves them. He wants them to come back to them. But it's a word of warning because they've seriously messed up. Josiah responds to the word and leads the people in reformation. I'm going to suggest three things for us to take away uh, with us from this passage tonight. And the first thing is this. We need to take God's judgment really seriously. Did you read in verse 12, where, have a look at verse 12, where he says this. He says, you know, the people think the God of the universe is going to do nothing good or nothing bad. God's just not going to do anything. And you know, when we're in the midst of, of like our busy lives, it can be really easy to think that. We kind of forget that like God's almighty, that God's powerful, that God's real. We forget it. I don't know, have you ever slipped into thinking that way? I think I have at times. God's just not going to do anything, nothing good or bad. God's just, you know, some sort of distant force up there. And Zephaniah says, no, God is real, God is alive, and God is going to do stuff. And actually, one of the things God's going to do is God's going to judge. So we need to take God's judgment seriously. And in verses four to six, um, we hear how he's going to judge God's people. And listen to this, because if you look at these verses really clearly, you can, you can draw this out from them. God's going to judge those of his people who worship other gods. God's going to judge those of his people who secretly worship other gods. When I'm eating the chocolate in the cupboard, so no one sees me, right? God's going to judge the people who worship several gods. The people who worship God, but then also worship other things. And finally, God's going to judge those who used to worship him but now neither seek God or inquire of him. Four things God points out that his people have messed up on and he's going to judge. And they're all around, what are they worshipping? Now, of course, um, we might not have a stone idol in our home uh, that we go back after church and bow down to. Uh, we may not. We may not kind of cons- worship the God of Molech and sacrifice our children to it. But there's still the question for us today and the question to challenge ourselves with. Actually, who or what are we worshipping? And you see, what and who we worship is so significant because it affects the orientation of the whole of our lives. So, like, it's really hard to watch pornography and sing a worship song at the same time. It's really hard to think ill of my neighbour and sing a worship song at the same time. It's really hard for my gaze to be on the Lord and worshipping him and to steal from the church offertory box at the back. Why? Because what and who we worship gets absorbed into all of our being and who we are. So what we choose to worship, what we choose to put our focus on is huge. And Zephaniah is saying, wake up. Who are you worshipping? Make sure it's the Lord. Second thing uh, that we can learn and take away from the passage is this. External reforms on their own don't work. Uh, What do I mean by this? Um, If I, uh, there's a classic one actually here in church, it just cracks me up all the time. We've got a little notice on the sound desk which says, don't leave your cup here. It's hilarious how many people leave their cup in that exact spot. And just because we've written the notice on there, 
has absolutely nothing to do with how people behave. Because, because like, we don't get stuff until we really deeply care about it. So, like, Stephen over there gets it because he understands, like, how awful it's going to be if, like, a cup of tea gets poured all over, like, the electrical equipment. Whereas I'm just a bit like, yeah, and leave my cup there. So, just by there being a note there doesn't, like, solve the thing, the problem. External reforms, just by sort of telling people to do stuff or rearranging the church furniture, or church will be really trendy if we do it in the round this week, or not, nothing against doing it in the round, that's great, or um, church is going to work really well if we do this, or, or things are going to be better if we do that. In and of themselves, even when those reforms are good, don't lead to long-lasting change. How do we learn this from this chapter? Well, we learn it because of this. Josiah instigated really great reforms. And for a while, they had an impact. But when he was just 39 years old, he died. And the people went back to their own ways. Without his leadership, they slipped back. And 20 years after that, in 586 BC, verse 4 is fulfilled. God's local judgment takes place on God's people. Babylon comes in, Jerusalem is wrecked, the people are carried off into exile. You see, external reforms, just trying to be good, or just following the signs or the leader, in and of themselves won't change us. So what does? What will change us? What will help us to be like God's people today? Well, we actually need what happened to Josiah to happen to us. You see, Josiah didn't just see Zephaniah's warnings, didn't just hear them. He then did something massively significant. He turned towards God with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his strength. And he had a change, a complete deep change of his heart and his mind. And so if I start to kind of care about the fact that we have sound in church and that it's like really good for everyone to hear and I begin to grasp that and I begin to take it into my head and my heart, the next time I'm tempted to put my cup of tea on the sign that says don't put your cup here, <laughs> I'm going to begin to think twice. It's actually what we need. We need the Holy Spirit to help us with this. There isn't a magic answer other than than God. You know, Jesus is the answer, the Sunday school answer. This is the point we get the Holy Spirit's the answer. We need the Holy Spirit to come and transform us head and heart. Finally, um, there is a little bit of hope in this chapter. So we need to take away the fact that judgment, God's judgment's serious. External reformation in and of itself isn't going to save us. But the third thing we get from this passage is a little bit of hope, and I'm going to come into land. But before I do, I'm just going to tell you a really, really cringy, cringy story. And um, before you judge me, can you just give me a little nod if you've ever done something wrong? Anyone ever done something wrong? Thank you, Beth. Love you, Beth. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Lovely. Um, <laughs> brilliant. So I'm not on my own here uh, before I tell you my embarrassing story. Um, so... When me and Rich got married, we were very blessed to have some lovely wedding presents. That was great. And uh, after our honeymoon, my really kind parents had put the wedding gifts in our flat. And we enjoyed opening them. And we wrote our thank you notes diligently. One of the presents was a mirror. And it was a really beautiful mirror. It was a round mirror. It was silver. And it had all these beautifully carved silver people all the way around the edge of the round mirror. Really gorgeous. Uh, really nice. And um, great. But when we couldn't find a card, we didn't know who it came from. And we tried and we searched and we just we couldn't work it out. And so that was that. And then although we liked the mirror and we, re we really liked the mirror, this important, really liked the mirror, 
we couldn't find a kind of place in the flat that it kind of worked. It just didn't like fit on any of the walls quite right. And so we just kept it in the box and years kind of went on. And sort of four or five years later, uh, we hit a summer that was really, really busy. And almost every weekend had some sort of celebration, some sort of party, someone was graduating, someone else was getting married. It was just one of those crazy summers. And uh, we were running a bit all over the place. We were dividing and conquering, going to different events and all that. And there was one weekend where we had a clash of weddings. We had Bethany's wedding and someone else's wedding. And I was going to somebody else's wedding. Richard was going to Bethany's wedding. And in our sort of chaos, in our disorganization, in our being poor vicars, um, we, we didn't get Bethany a wedding present. And, um, and we were sort of a bit panicked, and Richard had to go off to the wedding, and I just sort of was looking around the house, like, what can we give her? I need to send something, write a card. And I, was, and I came across this mirror, and I looked at it, and I just thought, this is so Bethany. This is so her. It's just, like, it's just the kind of thing that Bethany would buy. It's like, I can't, you know, she'd love this mirror, and we still haven't found anywhere to put up, and I, yeah re-gifted, you're already there, aren't you? I re-gifted the present that she gave to us. It was bad, it was bad. But having that awkward conversation, because she rang me. <laughs> Hi, Bethany, if you see this, I'm so sorry still. Anyway, I think we're still friends. Uh, we're on Facebook, anyway. Um, she rang me, <laughs> and she sort of said, um, you know, and we had that really awkward conversation and it was sort of like painfully awkward. And that sort of cringeworthy pain when we've been exposed is actually what we are meant to sit with for a while as we read this book of Zephaniah. Because where there is some glimpse of hope, and I will end with that in just a moment, too often we rush to the, the good bit. And actually sometimes sitting with the awkward bit allows God to work on us and in us in such a way to birth his fruit and to become more like him. And what God wants us to work on tonight is to think about, you know, how are we doing in our worship right now? Actually, God's judgment's really serious. But the hope we find in this passage, and there is some, largely comes in uh, verse 7. As we look at verse 7, it begins to talk about being silent before the Lord. And I think one of the first things we can do is we realize that God is a God of judgment, is to just come in silence before him. God, you are almighty. You are sovereign. And here am I on earth. Who am I? You are greater and higher than my thoughts. And to silence ourselves before God is a good place to start when we realize he is judge. The second thing we, we see over the passage is actually that it's begin to then seek God, to look on his face like Josiah did, and then begin to turn to him. But in verse 7, we get another hint, and that's that there is an atoning sacrifice. And those of you who've uh, been in church for a little while will know what that is hinting and pointing and projecting forward towards, that there always had to be a sacrifice for the mess. And we know, of course, that that ultimately got fulfilled in Jesus Jesus was the attaining sacrifice. But know that when he died for you, and he loved you so much, and he died for you, it wasn't cheap. It cost him. It cost him everything. And he went to that length for you and for me. So that on judgment day, However bad we have messed up, we are sheltered from the full force of God's judgment. 
as he takes our mess on himself. Now I'm going to hand over to Lydia. And I think what an appropriate moment to just rest with that as we head into communion.